Adani Group. Adani Group. Adani Group companies continue to slide for a third straight session. Continue to slide for a third straight session. Continue to slide for a third straight session. As most of you might already know, India's Adani Group made headlines at the start of this year after it was accused by US-based short seller Hindenburg Research of stock manipulation, unsustainable debt and use of tax havens. The Ports to Energy conglomerate, which operates seven publicly traded companies, had a combined valuation of $220 billion. But after the accusations, Adani's shares went into free fall, with the group's cumulative market value loss reaching a whopping $133 billion. The Adani group has denied the allegations, calling them malicious and baseless, and says its plans have not changed. But investors are clearly still nervous. So before we start, here are just five facts you need to know about the matter. Number one. After Hindenburg Research accused the group of brazen stock manipulation and accounting fraud, Adani's valuations have nearly halved. The group's founder, Gautam Adani, has seen billions wiped off his personal wealth. But even after three months of the alleged scandal, he is still number 25 on the list of the world's richest people. Number two. Initially, analysts were keenly watching whether there will be a regulatory inquiry into the group's corporate governance. The issue had also set off a political row over Adani's perceived closeness to Prime Minister Narendra Modi, which both denied. Number three, the embattled group was forced to call off its flagship Adani Enterprises' $2.45 billion FPO due to the market route. Number four, Despite the above, global rating agencies have mixed views on the Adani situation and the direct ramifications for the Adani group. Fitch Ratings said there was no immediate impact of the crisis on its ratings of the group's entities and its securities. And even though the firm's share prices have started recovering, they remain at almost half of their previous value. Now, just three months after Hindenburg's extreme accusations, Adani Group's renewable energy arm, Adani Green, announced a 49% jump in its operational capacity, which stood at 8,086 megawatts at the end of the fiscal year 2022-23. This jump is the largest capacity increase by any domestic renewable energy firm ever. With that, Adani Green remains the country's largest green energy business with a total install capacity of 20,000 megawatts. Despite its name that may sound to many as being that of an academic group or organization, this is actually a private company. More specifically, it's a hedge fund. What's a hedge fund? So, imagine you and your friends decide to start a pool of money to invest and make a profit. A hedge fund is a type of investment fund that pools money from investors to make investments in various financial markets, such as stocks, bonds, commodities and derivatives. The fund is supposed to be managed by a team of financial experts who are responsible for making investment decisions based on their analysis of market trends and other factors. Interestingly, Hedge funds are designed to be more flexible and less restricted than other types of investment funds. For example, hedge funds can use leverage, which means they can borrow money to invest and potentially increase their returns. They can also use complex investment strategies, such as short selling and derivatives, which are not available to other types of funds. So what is short selling? Short selling is a trading strategy used in financial markets where an investor borrows a security, usually a stock, from a broker and sells it in the market with the expectation that the price of the security will fall. The investor then buys back the same security at a lower price, returns it to the broker and pockets the difference between the selling price and the buying price as profit. However, if the stock price rises instead of falling, the investor will have to buy back the shares at a higher price, 
than they sold them for, leading to a loss. Additionally, there is a risk of unlimited losses in short selling as there is no upper limit to how high a stock price can rise. As such, short selling is generally considered a high risk strategy and is typically used by experienced traders and investors. So back to what's a hedge fund. Hedge funds also typically charge higher fees than other types of investment funds, which can include a management fee and a performance fee. This is because hedge funds are often targeting higher returns than other funds and their managers are compensated for their expertise in achieving those returns. Of course, investing in a hedge fund is not without other risks. The higher fees in complex investment strategies can make hedge funds more volatile and potentially more risky than other types of funds. However, many investors see hedge funds as an opportunity to potentially earn higher returns than they would with other types of investments. So that's a basic overview of how hedge funds work. They're essentially investment pools that use various strategies to try and generate profits for their investors. Of course, investing in any financial market always comes with some degree of risk. So it's important to do your research and make informed investment decisions. Back to Hindenburg research. So now you know that hedge funds are high risk investors in speculative markets and they short sell stocks meaning they make money when companies and or markets perform poorly and go down. And you also know that Hindenburg Research is a hedge fund, meaning they are under pressure to find potentially problematic companies. But short sellers do end up doing much more than that. Enter Mr. Anderson. The firm was founded by Nathan Anderson. It <laughs> in 2017 and has gained a reputation for its critical reports on companies in various industries including electric vehicles, healthcare and finance. The firm's research is naturally often highly critical of the companies it targets because it's a hedge fund and that's what hedge funds try to do. And its reports have led to significant declines in the stock prices of some of the companies it investigates, bringing Hindenburg and Anderson big profits along the way. Hindenburg Research's approach has garnered both praise and criticism, with some investors and analysts lauding the firm for its efforts to undercover fraud and protect investors, while others accusing it of engaging in market manipulation or short selling for profit. Whoa, market money what? Short for what? Slow down, bro. Market manipulation refers to a deliberate attempt to interfere with the natural market forces of supply and demand to create an artificial price movement in a financial asset. This can be done in many ways, such as spreading false rumors, insider trading, and creating fake buy or sell orders to influence the price of the asset. Yep, hedge funds do all these things all the time. So although short selling for profit is often a legitimate trading strategy, it can be used for market manipulation if traders like Anderson and Soros collude to artificially drive down the price of a stock or other asset. This is often done by first taking short positions against the company in large volumes, which basically means borrowing a lot of money and using it to bet or gamble or speculate that a stock or company will sink. Secondly, by spreading negative rumors about the company. And finally, by creating a negative perception about the company in the market. Such debt-fueled, negativity-driven roads that hedge funds take can sometimes even pressure them into downright lying. And history, new and old, is littered with examples of such high-risk players. Which is exactly why market manipulation and short selling for profit are actually illegal. Because they can have severe consequences for both the people and the companies that are victims of the unfair and predatory attacks of get-rich-quick hedge funds. They can also go so far as to undermine the integrity of financial markets and lead to significant financial losses for millions of small investors who are misled and cheated by false rumors or manipulated market conditions. And that is why regulators and law enforcement agencies often have to work hard together to detect and prevent market manipulation by hedge funds. 
so that fair and transparent trading practices may prevail in financial markets. And France just hates these guys. Well, short selling is not entirely banned in France, but it is subject to certain restrictions and regulations. In 2011, the French financial regulator, the L'Autorité des Marchés Financiers, or AMF, imposed a temporary ban on short selling during a period of market volatility. This ban was later extended and made permanent in some cases. This ban was because of serious concerns that during times of market stress, short selling could destabilize financial markets and even the entire economy of a nation. AMF believed that short selling could amplify market declines and create a negative feedback loop, leading to further market turbulence. Remember, stock markets are driven way more by market sentiments than by highly informed, well-researched investors. So the ban by France on short selling was intended to provide a temporary relief valve for the already stressed financial markets and prevent a potential systemic crisis. However, critics of the ban argue that short selling can serve as a useful market mechanism for price discovery and risk management. They also point out that the ban could harm market liquidity and hinder the ability of investors to manage their portfolios effectively. But that's what critics do. They criticize and governments in democracies do what they can to protect their citizens. In summary, short selling is subject to restrictions and regulations in France and the AMF has imposed temporary bans on short selling during times of market volatility to prevent potential systemic risks, such as the destabilizing of an entire nation economy by economic hitmen. Which brings us to our next antagonist, George Soros, and he needs no introduction. But we'll introduce George Soros anyway. George Soros is a Hungarian-born American billionaire investor and political activist. He was born on August 12, 1930 in Budapest, Hungary to a Jewish family. During the Second World War, Soros survived the Nazi occupation of Hungary. In 1947, he emigrated to the UK where he studied at the very posh London School of Economics. Soros then started his financial career working for various banks and investment firms before he started his own, you guessed it, hedge fund called the Soros Fund Management in 1969. George is known for his savvy investment strategies, including his bet against the British pound in 1992 that earned him a billion dollars in a single day. So what can a common person like you or me do with a billion dollars in a day. Frankly, the sheer mechanics are mind-boggling. I mean, even if we were to spend a thousand dollars a day, it would take us about 3,000 years to burn it all. And how did he make a billion dollars in one day? Well, just by doing what hedge funds do, by profiting majorly from a major downfall that need not have happened. George Soros' most notable financial involvement was in the Black Wednesday event which occurred on September 16, 1992. At that time, Soros made a billion dollar profit by betting against the British pound. You see, during the early 1990s, the UK was a part of the European Exchange Rate Mechanism or the ERM, which was established to manage exchange rate fluctuations between the participating countries. However, the UK was in a difficult economic position with high inflation and low economic growth, which made it increasingly difficult to maintain the exchange rate of the pound. Soros and his team saw this as an opportunity and began betting against the pound. They believed that the UK government would be forced to devalue the currency and leave the ERM, which would result in a decline in the pound's value. To accomplish this, Soros used a combination of spot and forward trades. He also leveraged the position by borrowing billions of pounds and selling them in the market, which drove the pound even lower. As the pressure on the pound mounted, the UK government was forced to withdraw the pound from the ERM, which led to a sharp decline in its value. Soros and his team made a profit of around $1 billion on this bet. It's remarkable to notice here that not only did George Soros predict 
the fall of the pound, but he brought it about in some sense. This event is now famously known as Black Wednesday, and it had significant consequences for the UK's economy. The decline in the pound's value resulted in higher inflation and interest rates, and it took several years for the UK's economy to recover. Soros's bet against the pound made him famous overnight and cemented his reputation as a legendary investor. It also gave him the nickname of the man who broke the Bank of England. Back to George Soros, an introduction. And we really thought we didn't need one. It's amazing how there's always so much more than meets the common eye. Of course, like all people who make obscene amounts of money in ways most people have never even heard of, let alone understand, Soros is also a well-known philanthropist and political activist who has donated billions of dollars to influence various people and causes. And in 1979, Soros launched a global network of NGOs called Open Society Foundations, which has since become one of the largest philanthropic and political lobbying organizations in the world. For perspective, the Sacklers, the family behind the recent American opioid crisis that killed 106,000 people in 2021 alone and continues to kill 150 people, including teenagers every day, even today, is now witnessing the removal of their names from the galleries and other places that they made donations to. Or more like they showed the world they were making charitable donations to needy individuals and organizations, but in reality were actually using those poor and needy to whitewash their image. So first you kill many, many people with your fentanyl and other drugs, or maybe rumors in the case of hedge funds, and then you try to actually look good by giving some loose change to some people. The secret sauce in both cases is to execute humongous crimes against entire societies and to look good while doing it. Unsurprisingly, Soros has also been a target of criticism, especially from conservative politicians and media outlets who expose him for trying to influence elections and promoting a liberal agenda for his personal short-term financial gains. In fact, countries have even banned OSF for being nothing more than a front for Soros's ruthless, profit-hungry plans. But donations do bring influence, so despite the controversies surrounding him, or probably because of them, Soros has secured many awards and honours, including the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 2015. Bad Losers So when the Hindenburg Hedge Funds report accusing Adani came out on January 24, 2023, Adani immediately refuted all claims and released a 413-page response. This by itself doesn't mean that Adani has nothing to hide, but it is very important to bear in mind that it also does not mean that what Hindenburg is accusing is all true. After all, we have seen enough examples of how greedy and unscrupulous hedge funds spread false rumors to hurt others unfairly and get very rich very quickly. But when the report failed to have the devastating effect, Hindenburg might have needed to repay the loans hedge fund stake to bankroll such operations, and its short-selling bet appeared to be losing. Another hedge fund investor, George Soros, who was speaking at the Munich Security Conference on February 16, upped the ante. He first commented on the Hindenburg research report critical of the Adani group, and then went on to add that it will weaken Modi's stranglehold on India's federal government and open the door to push for much needed institutional reforms. I may be naive, but I expect a democratic revival in India. This was explosive stuff because in one fell swoop, he's saying that India, the world's second largest nation and third largest economy is not a democracy, but something what, like an ISIS-style breakout area, maybe? Controlled by Narendra Modi, the democratically elected prime minister, who is extremely popular in India and abroad. It was like George Soros did not wish to know or remember that Indian elections, like those in all modern societies, are conducted under expert and strict international supervision and have the seal of approval of the entire democratic world of nations both big and small. What followed was swift and strong. Almost immediately, India's union minister, Smriti Irani, condemned billionaire George Soros' remarks on India. During a press conference, Irani called upon every Indian to denounce Soros' intention to demonize Indian democracy. She explained how Soros is tarnishing Indian democracy and bringing about a nationwide economic downfall for his personal gains. Irani also boldly stated that Indians have previously defeated foreign powers who tried to meddle with India's internal affairs and will continue to do so. She concluded that schemes to weaken Indian democracy will be met with all of India's might under the leadership of PM Modi. 
Additionally, Irani mentioned the time when India became the fifth largest economy in the world and how foreign powers, including the presidents of the US, France and the PM of England, publicly extended gratitude to PM Modi for enabling employment in their nations. Irani stated that this is an example of the neo-imperialistic intentions of an entrepreneur coming to light. Within days of Soros's comments, India's external affairs minister S. Jai Shankar was quoted by ANI as saying, Mr. Soros is a... Uh, old, rich, opinionated person sitting in New York who still thinks that his views should determine how the entire world works. Now, if I could only stop at old, rich and opinionated, I would put it away. But he is old, rich, opinionated and dangerous, you know, because what happens is he hit out at Soros for his opening the door to a democratic revival remark about India. Jai Shankar said, people like him think an election is good if the person they want to see wins and if the election throws up a different outcome, then they will say it is a flawed democracy. And the beauty is that all this is done under the pretense of advocacy of open society. BJP spokesperson Gaurav Bhatia highlighted the involvement of Salil Shetty, vice president of Soros' Open Society Foundation in India, in Rahul Gandhi's Bharat Jodo Yatra. India stands united against anti-India rants of George Soros. As a nation, we are capable of dealing with such pygmies. The more worrisome side is his aide Salil Shetty walking hand in hand with Rahul Gandhi during Bharat Jodo Yatra. Bhatia tweeted. A summary, please. George Soros, Open Society Foundations and Nathan Anderson, Hindenburg Research, are uber rich people and companies that make more money than God by bringing about changes in markets and societies. And they often choose companies like Adani and nations like India because killing big companies means big paychecks. And spreading rumors is cheap and easier in emerging economies with far from perfect standards of education and critical thinking. Ironically, people and economies in Asia, Africa, South America, basically previous colonies of Europeans and Americans like Soros and Anderson, are poor and easy to exploit by the West even today because they have been conquered, looted and held back from developing by the West for centuries now. So maybe this is a new tale of Adani scamming people. Or maybe it's a hidden tale of Hindenburg and Soros trying desperately to make billions more to repay the loans they took out to bet against Adani and India, which is business as usual for hedge funds. Or maybe it's the same old tale of the colonization and exploitation of the mines, markets, lands, people, nature, basically any and all resources that belong to unsuspecting masses to enrich an already obscenely rich few. Whatever you choose to decide, please consider one more fact. Everyone knows how much Adani lost. But despite several attempts, no one has been able to convince Mr. Anderson and Hindenburg or George Soros to share with the world how much money they made and continue to make from this operation. Epilogue why is Nathan Anderson's hedge fund called Hindenburg Research? According to Nathan Anderson, the founder of Hindenburg Research, the firm was named after the German airship LZ-129 Hindenburg, which famously caught fire and crashed in New Jersey in 1937. Anderson has stated that the name reflects the firm's mission to expose corporate fraud and malfeasance, similar to how the Hindenburg disaster brought attention to the dangers of air travel and led to improved safety regulations. The name also suggests that the firm is willing to take on powerful corporations and stand up for investors even in the face of significant risks and challenges. This is what Mr. Anderson has told everyone and what most people believe. But we like digging a little deeper, yes? So before we swallow another one of Mr. Anderson's statements, let us ask, what was the Hindenburg airship, the airship that Hindenburg Research is named after, named after? And what do we learn? Well, the airship LZ or LZ-129 Hindenburg was named after the late German president Paul von Hindenburg who served as president of Weimar Republic from 1925 until his death in 1934. Hindenburg was a celebrated military leader in World War I and later became a prominent figure in German politics. He was elected president in 1925 and his presidency was marked by a series of crises and challenges, including economic turmoil, political instability 
and the rise of extremist movements such as the Nazi party. Despite these challenges, Hindenburg remained a respected figure and was widely seen as a stabilizing force in German politics. Hindenburg is perhaps best known for his role in appointing Adolf Hitler as Chancellor of Germany in 1933, a decision that ultimately contributed to the downfall of the Weimar Republic and the rise of Nazi Germany. Hindenburg died in August 1934 at the age of 86 and Hitler used his death to further consolidate power, assuming the position of president and declaring himself Führer of Germany. This is how Hindenburg's initial support for Hitler helped pave the way for the rise of the dictator and his legacy continues to be a subject of debate and controversy in modern Germany. But why did the Hindenburg airship crash? Basically, it caught fire and crashed, killing 36 people because it was filled with hydrogen and not the safer fuel helium. And why was it not using helium? Because despite being aware of the risk of accident and death due to the use of hydrogen in airships, America did not supply helium to Germany. You see? During the 1930s, the United States was the world's largest producer of helium. It had a virtual monopoly on the gas, but the US government was reluctant to sell helium to foreign powers, especially those with aggressive expansionist policies such as Nazi Germany. Clearly, there were political and ideological concerns that mattered more to the US than the saving of human lives, just as profits matter more to hedge funds than the well-being of emerging investors companies and nations, and many have suggested that anti-Nazi elements such as communists, anti-Nazi Germans, Jews and Spaniards, presumably angered by Germany's support for the fascist leader Francisco Franco, were responsible for deliberately crashing the Hindenburg airship. At least one correspondent suggested it was an inside job, that the Nazis themselves had blown up the Hindenburg for the insurance money, while others blamed America. One letter writer, for example, insisted it had been shot down by a New York City police lieutenant or lieutenant on the orders of Mayor Fiorello La Guardia. The most common suspicion, though, was that a bomb had been hidden somewhere within the ship's vast interior, ready to be activated by either a timer or a change in barometric pressure. One such sabotage theory focused on an American passenger named Joseph Spa. A German steward reported that he seemed suspiciously aloof and unsympathetic to the airship travel. It also happened that Spa was a professional contortionist and acrobat, useful talents for climbing around the ship's interior structure and planting a bomb. So it turns out that the Hindenburg airship disaster was not as Mr. Nathan Anderson of Hindenburg Research Hedge Fund would like us believe, a result of people ignoring valid warnings from scientific experts, but of rich experts choosing not to prioritize human well-being.